So we've got another email from one of my subscribers who goes by the name of Matthew. And his email reads, I hope you can help me answer this question that I've been struggling with for the past three years since I got saved. Since getting saved, my family has basically disowned me. I was lucky enough to get a job after graduating high school and I have my own apartment and car, so I'm not really struggling in that area. But even at my job, I'm looked down on because I let it be known that I'm a Christian. I have no friends and suffer from an illness that makes living difficult. I live check to check and sometimes don't have enough money for food throughout the weeks. Living is just hard and I'm only 23 years of age. Can't imagine what life is gonna be like for me at 40. Why hasn't life gotten better? Does God hate me? Is it because of my sin that I'm struggling so bad? My family is well off and they hate God. Make this make sense, brother. Thank you. So thank you for your question, Matthew. And so life is hard for you, is that right? Welcome to Christianity, it's supposed to be hard. The lot of the true Christian's life is suffering. We are never promised in scripture that once you come to Christ, everything gets better as far as life circumstances. No, we are actually told that all who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted, 2 Timothy 3.12. And the truth is, us Christians here in America really don't even know what real persecution truly is or real suffering truly is. All over this world, especially in the Middle East, Christians, our brethren, are being killed because they profess faith in Christ. I mean, you think your day is bad? Imagine having your whole family wiped out, burned alive because you're a professing Christian. This is why Christians need to study the New Testament, because so many professing Christians have such a wrong idea about what it means to be a true Christian. This isn't about your best life now. Now don't mishear me here. God does want you to be happy and joyful, but not in your circumstance, but rather in himself. But here's what's interesting. He uses your circumstances to do that. And one of my favorite verses I use to encourage myself during struggles is Romans 8, 36 through seven. As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Now, when we look at the word conquer, <clears throat> a conqueror has basically conquered his enemies at his feet. They're at his feet. They're dead. They're done. He has basically defeated the enemy. But more than conquerors means that the conquered things in our lives are not just conquered, but that they are serving, serving you unto God, serving you unto God. God works through your sorrows. And Jesus, being the prime example of all things, was the king of sorrows and was always acquainted with grief. It's important to understand that. Okay. Set your, <clears throat> set your eyes on your hope, not on your circumstances. And if you do this by faith, all your needs will be met. Listen, God has never failed me. God has always provided more than I could ever need or deserve. That's what he does for his children. He provides, just not in the way the world would depict that should be, okay? We're not to look at how the world views things, okay? We don't view things through those lenses anymore, okay? That's not how God works. It's not how God works. Um, and one of my favorite quotes from John Piper is life is hard, but God is good. He truly is good. And so my, 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 this is what I want you to focus on and to anyone dealing with this. Okay. Understand that persecution is the Christian's lot suffering. You're supposed to suffer. Okay. And the truth is everyone suffers. Everyone suffers, whether you're rich or whether you're homeless living on the street, everyone's going through things. That's the way God made life. Okay. No one's just peacefully going through life without problems or trials. The difference between the Christian and those in the world is we have a hope. We have a hope, okay? Let that hope get you to the end. Allow that hope to get you there. Because without without setting your sights on our hope in Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus, Jesus Christ, I mean, you're not just making it way harder than it should be for you. Uh, it's, it's an easy way to fall out of the race. OK, so again, take your eyes off of your circumstances and set them on the finished work of Jesus Christ by faith. We don't rejoice that we have a headache. We don't rejoice that we have cancer eating away at us. What we do rejoice in is the presence of God in the midst of our pain. But again, we have to understand, lest we fall into being absolutely undone and astonished whenever affliction hits us, that we are to expect it. It's part of our call as Christians, that God has called us into a fallen world to minister into a world that is a veil of tears, and it's a place of pain, and there's no way that we can ever expect to escape it. Now, suppose I'm afflicted with suffering. Why? 
Why am I afflicted? Well, there could be several reasons. It may be that God needs to correct me and that it is part of his corrective wrath to make me sick or to bring me low. He does that. There are manifold examples of that in Scripture. How did Miriam get leprosy? God gave her leprosy to bring her to repentance. What is Jesus saying here? Unless you repent, you all likewise perish. Sometimes the suffering that we have in this world is because God is correcting us or disciplining us. But we can't jump to the conclusion that every time we get sick or every time we suffer, that is, there's a direct correlation between our disobedience and the pain that we're experiencing. Again, Job is exhibit A to refute that argument. Job was more righteous than anybody else, and yet he suffered more than anybody else, and it would have been a terrible mistake to assume that there was a direct proportionate relationship between the degree of his guilt and the degree of his pain. We mustn't do that. And so we don't always know. And we don't have to know. What we have to know is him. Because when Job demanded an answer for his pain, and asked God to speak to him and explain it to him. And God finally appeared to Job and interrogated Job for several chapters. What answer did Job get from God? He didn't get one. God didn't say to Job, you're suffering this pain for this, 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 and this. The only answer that Job got to his affliction in the final analysis was God himself, the presence of God. And in effect, what God was saying is, Job, here I am. I am with you. Trust me. Now, when people say, trust me, it's time to run. But when God says, trust me, it's time to trust. And let me finish by reminding you that our God never promised any of us that we would never go into the valley of the shadow of death. What he did promise us was that he would go with us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We have the Good Shepherd. We have his presence. We have his consolation. That doesn't mean we're removed from the arena of pain, but that we are upheld in the arena of pain.